Good morning. It's good to see you. Glad you're here to worship the Lord. Today, we're sort of uh, winding up. We've got two more weeks. We're winding up a series on worship, and we're going to be looking at some different Greek and Hebrew words that talk about what happens during worship. It's either going to be um, a great success or a terrible disaster with all those Hebrew words. We'll see. Um, Good things that are going on today, Uh, I want to uh, draw your attention in your bulletin to the appointments that you can make to have your picture made for the directory, that's really wonderful, and also our silent auction is coming up next week. Uh, I'm excited about that, it's going to be a lot of fun, and um, uh, I hope that you're getting ready for it. And now we have a word about that from John Minnick. John? Why don't you come and see if uh, you can use this? Ah, wait just a minute. I'm going to hand you a microphone. Thank you. I'm not sure I need this at all. I tend to be too loud, so I'll try not to. (laughs) It'll record better if you use that. I also normally come to the middle service, so my voice isn't fully warmed up. But uh, I'll do my best. So thank you, John. I just wanted to uh, wish everybody a good morning and let you know what's going on with the silent auction. We've had a number of questions that have uh, come up. Uh, Just people don't understand the logistics, what it is we're doing, uh, what kind of uh, items we're going to have for auction. And I thought I'd just share with you for a few minutes what's going on. Um, And when I came in this morning, I noticed on the raccoonometer, is that what it's called, The, uh, the, the gauge out front? says we're up to uh, $65,000, which is awesome. And so the silent auction is just a part of the ongoing uh, giving that's been happening. And everyone, a lot of people have already given generously. So this is just another way for us to reach out to the community and see if we can get donations from people and, and then generate uh, some of the money we need for, for the recovery effort that we're, we're going through. So, uh, so the event itself, the, the silent auction is going to be a week from today. Uh, Sunday the 22nd, it's going to be from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the evening at Trio in Kitty Hawk. So if you don't know where Trio is, it's on milepost 4.5 on the bypass. On the west side of the, the bypass, if you know where Diamonds and Dunes is, or the Knitting Addiction, or the Spa, we're in the same building they're in. So that's, that's, that's where you need to be. Um, the, uh, the auction's open to the public. Uh, the, the business will be open to the public. The, the auction itself will be in our upstairs mezzanine. <clears throat> so when you walk in, you'll see a staircase in front of you. You just go straight up. There's no cover charge. Uh, we will have a suggested donation of uh, $10 to get a bid number. And we have a lot of great items up for bid, and people have been very generous. A lot of people from the church and people from outside the church who have given great items for auction. Uh, I have had a number of people ask me, you know, I want to participate should I go out and, and buy a gift certificate and, um, you know, and, and donate that to the auction? And, and most of the things that we have in the auction have been donated by businesses. And I, don't, I would suggest to you, if you're in that position, that, that would be great. You could also consider just coming with the money you are going to contribute to that and bid on some great items and get some good deals. Uh, so we have everyday items, a dozen golf balls, a haircut, things like that. I'm, I'm going to totally outbid everybody on the, hair, on the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Haircut's mine. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and then we also have some great handmade items, a sweater, um, you know, a quilt, uh, some homemade furniture, and we have some nice luxury items. So there's some really, really special things that we have for auction. We have uh, three days and two nights at a house in Palmer's Island on the beachfront, which is a beautiful community just north of the Sanderling, uh, with chef services provided. Uh, a week at a luxury condo in Raleigh that was donated. Um, a couple days in an oceanfront suite and shutters on the banks. So a, a wide range of things that are going on. What we really need you to do is come out, bring your friends, have a good time, and uh, help, help the church. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. It's kind of cool. Uh, John uh, does silent auctions at Trio once in a while for uh, community um, needs. And it was really cool that he came to us and said, 
I'd be happy to give leadership to a silent auction for the raccoon fund. So, you know, everybody has different skills, don't they? Different connections, different areas of expertise, and everybody just works together to make a glorious whole, and I think that's really cool. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Oh, will you be sure to register your attendance on the little blue pad closest to the uh, aisle? Uh, whether you get to be here once in a while or every Sunday, if you'll get that little blue pad, take all the room you need to write legibly and pass it down so everybody gets a chance. That'll be great. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to draw your attention to is the Connect class that will be happening the last Sunday in this month from 3.30 to 7.30. If you haven't yet been a part of the T Connect class, I invite you to come. I think you will really enjoy it. I think you'll benefit in that you'll understand even more clearly how uh, Methodism fits within the family of churches and what the mission of Duck Church in particular is. Um, so if you haven't come, please uh, give the church office a call and let us know that you'll be on the way. We'll be glad to see you there. Uh, who would you like for us to pray for this morning? Feel free just to call their names. Thank you. 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 Let's pray. Oh, glorious God and Father. We come into your house to worship you. And we pray that as in our hearts we bow low before you in adoration, that you would lift us up to the heights of heaven. As we come to you, Lord, we, we come bringing with us our loved ones on our hearts and on our lips, asking you to bless them. You know their needs. And as much as we love them, you love them yet more. Thank you for your kindness to us and to our loved ones. We pray that you bless us in our worship this morning, Lord. Let us sense your presence because we know, Jesus, that you said, where even two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. We love you. Amen. The opening hymn is an insert in your bulletin, and I don't know if it's familiar to you or not. Uh, it's from the 1920s Cokesbury Methodist Hymnal. And one of the reasons I picked it is because one of the worship words uh, uh, from Hebrew is to shout. And if you knew this song very well, it would feel a little bit like a shout of praise to the Lord. If you're just learning it, it may take you till the third verse. But I hope that you'll enjoy it. Uh, the, fir the first parts of the verses are on the front, the refrain is on the back. Suzette, give us time to switch pages from front to back for second and third verses, okay? Stand up, let's see.
Dear beloved, the scriptures move us to acknowledge and confess our sins before Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice unto the throne of heavenly grace. Let us pray. Grant me, even me, my dearest Lord, to know Thee and love Thee and rejoice in Thee. And if I cannot do these perfectly in this life, let me at least advance to higher degrees every day till I can come to do them in perfection. Let the knowledge of Thee increase in me here, that it may be full hereafter. Let the love of thee grow every day more and more here, that it may be perfect hereafter, that my joy may be great in itself and full in thee. I know, O God, that thou art a God of truth. O make good thy gracious promises to me, that my joy may be full. Amen. Please continue in silent confession. O Lord, we beseech Thee, absolve Thy people from their offenses, that through Thy bountiful goodness we may be delivered from the bonds of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers will come forward, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
Heavenly Father, the people of the Old Testament would do a wave offering. They would, be, they would bring grain and they would wave it before you in worship, in praise and thanksgiving, acknowledging that you're the author of everything that we have and enjoy, asking you to bless us with more of your bounty. And so we lift these gifts to you, Lord, and we we wave them before you with thanksgiving and exultation. And we ask that you bless us yet more and again through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I have to say I've got to check the bulletin to now to see what comes next. <laughs> you get to pass the piece now. <laughs> I didn't know if you would remember Love, Mercy, and Grace from the Cokesbury, but I knew that you knew Lord of the Dance. <laughs> Let's see.
us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. you to remain standing for the reading of the gospel lesson which is taken from Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. This comes right at the end of Matthew's gospel and it's the moment of the ascension when Jesus gives the great commission to the disciples. It says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We're looking at uh, the in and the out of worship today. The in and the out. And what I mean by the in and the out of worship is that when we worship, it involves two things. It involves in our heart, that's the in, in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit. We're worshiping God in our hearts. And it also involves outwardly what we're doing with our bodies. So the out is what we're doing with our bodies. The in is what we're doing in our hearts. Um, what we want to do is we want to try to get those two things together. It doesn't always work out that way. But we want to get our bodies and our hearts both in sync with worshiping God. Now, you know that what you do with your body sometimes causes your heart to follow. You know, uh, sometimes people say if you're feeling unhappy, if, you're, if you'll smile, then it might make you actually feel a little better. Do you ever try that? I do too, and sometimes it works. It depends on how unhappy I am. <laughs> If I'm only a little unhappy, if I smile, it does seem to sort of brighten things up. Uh, if I'm very unhappy, for good reason, even smiling is not going to help. But the, the idea is that sometimes um, your heart and your mind follow what your body is doing. And then sometimes it doesn't. But in worship, what we want to do is we want to we worship the Lord with our bodies and with our hearts. Um, People who worship God, and I'm not talking about here at Duck Church or just Methodists, but one of, the, um, one of the casualties of worship, if you will, 
is that sometimes we get into um, a habit that is not meaningful for us. Now, that's the opposite of a habit that is meaningful. I'm not saying worship habits are bad. I think worship habits are really, really good. Kind of like we were just singing, Lord of the Dance. I don't know what kind of dance you do when you're dancing, but I really enjoyed learning the steps. Learning the steps to rumba, to waltz, to swing. I enjoyed learning the steps because once I learned the steps, and it took some practice, but once I learned the steps, when the music was playing, Elizabeth and I could dance and have a good time. But the first thing I had to do was learn the steps, and after the steps were memorized, then, you know, it's kind of free. So in worship, one of the reasons I think ritual is really good uh, one of the reasons I often use the same prayers Sunday after Sunday is in this hope and in this idea that um, we'll become so familiar with the steps that our hearts are free to worship while we do those familiar steps. For instance, every Sunday you hear the prayer of absolution. I hope during the week when you catch yourself sinning, that you think to yourself, yeah, I didn't do that too well. You know, that was, that was unworthy of the Lord, and, and it was unworthy of me too. But I'm going to church on Sunday, and I know there's going to be a prayer of confession. And I know that after the corporate prayer of confession, when we all admit in front of God and each other that we're all sinners, there's going to be a time of silent confession. And during that silent confession, I'm going to church, and I'm going to silently confess this sin to God. And after I do, I know John's going to pray that prayer he prays, that prayer of absolution. And then we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And that is a meaningful ritual of confession and forgiveness for me. So I hope you look forward to that when you catch yourself sinning during the week. That's one of those sort of rituals of worship that it can be it can be meaningless if it's just kind of like, okay, we're reading now. Okay, it's supposed to be silent now, but people are fidgeting and coughing. Okay, now John's going to pray that same prayer he prays every week, whatever, right? That is not very useful, but if we take learning the dance steps, you know, uh, if we take learning this ritual uh, that we're comfortable with, that we know we can depend on week after week, then we can marry the outward form of worship with the worship in our heart, and we can look forward to doing that. So one of the things that we do in worship is we have ritual that we do so that um, we can join what we do outwardly and what we do in our hearts. One of the uh, liabilities of, of worship uh, is that sometimes God's people forget what they're doing. Sometimes God's people get in the habit of, of going to worship, and the truth is their mind is not really worshiping God at all. I'm guessing that once in a while this happens to everybody, once in a while, maybe you come. I'm sorry, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Maybe you had a big Saturday night, right? Maybe once in a while you come to worship and, you know, you're just not into it, but you're here. I think you get big points for that, okay? Like, I think just showing up for worship is a really cool thing, and I think God looks and says, wow, there's Dean uh, I know where he was last night. He was out till late partying, and here he is worshiping me at 8 o'clock in the morning. I have to say, I think that really honors God. Uh, when you're tired, either from going to a party or from working or whatever, but when you're tired, or maybe you didn't sleep well, or maybe you were in pain, and you got up and you came to worship, sometimes just showing up is a big deal. Sometimes it's hard just to show up. But when you show up and your body is in this pew, you're physically saying, I am here 
to worship you, God. You are the most important thing in my life. And showing up is a way that we show that. That is a cool thing. What's not a cool thing is when worshiping congregations, and I'm just taking both sides of this as we, as we look at what God says about worship in the Bible. What's not a cool thing is when a worshiping congregation or individuals who are worshiping um, are showing up in body but not in mind and heart. They're showing up in body but really they're no longer really connecting with God. Uh, they're going through, for instance, maybe the ritual of the prayer of forgiveness and repentance, but in their heart, they're repenting of nothing. They're going through the ritual of praising God, but in their heart, they're not praising God. They're going through the ritual of now the sermon's preaching, the, the pastor's preaching, but they're not really keying into the word. And again, I'm not saying that all of us don't find ourselves in that position sometimes. But if we find ourselves slipping into a habit of being present in body but not in heart, that's not a good thing. Especially if we're doing it not to show up for God, but to show up for some other reason. Once in a while, there's a temptation to show up not for God, to worship not for God, but to be thinking, what do other people think about what I'm doing? That's not always a good thing. It's important to remember that the object of our worship is the living God. And he knows what's on your mind. He knows what's in your heart. And when we come to worship, one of the things we want to try to do is we want to try to corral our thoughts. They can wander everywhere, can't they? And we don't want to be mean to ourselves when our minds wander. But we want to keep like two-year-olds. You know how two-year-olds, if you let them loose in the sanctuary, they might run around. And you keep trying to coax them back. Come on, Johnny. Come back. Come back. Right? Uh, Sometimes our thoughts are like two-year-olds. We want to be gentle and kind with them, but also firm. And so sometimes in worship, um, our thoughts are wandering everywhere. They're wandering to what we're going to have for lunch. Uh, maybe we're going to have uh, company for dinner. Or maybe we've got something really difficult coming ne up next week, and we find ourselves sort of thinking about that. Um, that might be good. You know, it might be that you're, you're thinking about what's important in your life in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and God is speaking to you, and that's a very good thing. But if, if your mind is just wandering, then that's not a very good thing, because we want to worship God, not just with our bodies, but we want to worship God really intentionally with our mind, really focus on our mind what we're doing. In fact, God has some really unpleasant words for Israel, and it's sort of the flip side of worship. I'm going to turn to Isaiah. Um, now, again, I, I don't think this applies to us, but it's good just to hear uh, one of the sort of challenges of worship that God's people have faced in the past. You remember the Israelite people got to the point that um, they were, not all, but some, were making sacrifices to God, but they weren't repenting in their hearts. They were making sacrifices to God, but in their hearts, they weren't really worshiping God. And this is, this is what the scripture says in Isaiah. <laughs> what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more, bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation, 
I cannot endure assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. What is God saying through Isaiah here? Sometimes the people of Israel had gotten to a point that they thought that if they came to the temple, which they had built splendidly before God, and if they brought the required sacrifices of bulls or rams or sheep or goat, that God was satisfied. Hey, what more does God want? We built him this great temple. We showed up, we brought sacrifices, there you go. That's enough. God's been paid. And God says, wow, you're just wearing me out. You're just wearing me out. It makes me tired to see you come to my house week after week with your sacrifices. Uh, and you burn incense and you make all your sacrifices. But you're neglecting what's really important. Mm, what's really important to me is that you really repent in your heart of the things that you do that are wrong. What's really important to me is that you really focus on how important justice is. What's important to me is you really focus on the oppressed. What's important to me is that you take care of the needy. What's important to me is that you take care of the widow and the orphan. It's good to be reminded of that, isn't it? God's not saying that <laughs> he doesn't love our sacrifices. God's not saying he doesn't love and honor the offerings that he make, we, he, we make to him. God's not saying that he doesn't like the sweet smell of incense. What God is saying is, when we burn incense to God, when we make offerings to God, but in our hearts we're unrepentant, the incense and the offerings don't make any difference. What's really important to God is what's in our hearts. And then that we show that in our outward actions. I want to be clear here. It's not either or, it's both and. There's also something fake about saying, oh well, I don't go to church on Sunday because, you know, it's just a personal thing between me and God. I don't go to church on Sunday because, you know, it's just in my heart. Um, the scripture tells us over and over that that doesn't cut it. The scripture tells us over and over that those who really love God are supposed to assemble themselves together in the great congregation. The scripture tells us over and over, the scripture tells us over and over that we are supposed to not only be worshiping God in our hearts, but also in our actions. And so we repent in our hearts. And we also bring offerings of thanksgiving. We're receptive to God in our hearts and minds. And we come into the great congregation. And we try to sing the hymns that the pastor selects. <laughs> and sometimes that's really easy. When we get to sing Lord of the Dance. And sometimes it's really hard when he picks something obscure from 1923. Or worse yet from 1687 yeah and so you know you're always so good-natured you you really you you try 
Uh, you know, you try to uh, worship through the liturgy that we use, and the whole effort is just to give us a vehicle for praising God, a vehicle for thanking God. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, that's a pretty good sermon, but I don't see what it has to do with the text that the preacher read. That's sort of true, and I'm going to tell you why. The reason I chose the text that I chose is because when it says that Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples before he ascended into heaven, he appeared to the 11 disciples and it says that they worshiped him. Okay, so there's the tie-in and this is what I, I want you to think about. When it says they worshiped him, what do you think that means? Now, I'm not asking you to actually call it out. But just in your mind, when it says Jesus appeared before the eleven on the mountain and they worshipped him, what do you think that means? Now, being good Methodists, okay, being good Protestants, we probably mean that we think that, we probably think that that means that they sort of stood very solemnly and still and in their minds, they thought how cool Jesus was. I mean, sometimes that's what we mean by worship, isn't it? Right? When we come to worship, you know, we come and we, we sing a hymn, right? And we try to, in our minds, you know, thank and glorify God. And I'm not low-rating that. That's really important. We've already talked about that. But one of the things that I really thought was cool as I was studying worship for this sermon series is that worship is not just a sense of awe. That's part of it. Part of worship is a sense of awe. And there's a Hebrew word for that and a Greek word for that. And I'm not going to burden you with those right now. But a sense of awe is a part of worship. But one of the things that's really interesting is that very often in the New Testament, when you see the word where it says, and they worshiped him, it means that they did obeisance to him. That is the literal definition. When you see this word worship, the Greek word is praseo, and the word praseo, oh look, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, John. Well done, son. Yeah. Prese <laughs> Proskineo, thank you. Proskineo, to do obeisance, and it means to kiss toward. The pros, P-R-O-S, means toward, in the direction of. And the kineo means to kiss. And so the word for worship is this uh, proskineo, to do obeisance, to kiss toward. And so whenever uh, this word proskineo is used in the New Testament, it literally means that the person got on their knees and they may very well have then touched their forehead to the ground or they may have just simply gotten on their knees and kissed the foot or the hand of Jesus. But when it says that they, they worshiped him, it doesn't just mean that they became internally aware of a sense of awe. It means that they literally bowed down before him. You remember in Matthew's gospel when the Magi came bringing gifts to Jesus and it says they bowed down and worshipped him? It's this word, this proskineo, uh, that's used. That they, they literally, they got on their knees and they did obeisance before him. Over and over in the New Testament, um, when you see this word worship used, it's usually not denoting a sense of awe. It's usually denoting getting on your face before God, or at the very least, getting on your knees before God. Thank you, son. Um, I found this really meaningful. Uh, because being a Methodist all my life, 
one of the main ways we worship is, I mean, we sing hymns, right? And we listen to the word preached, and we pray prayers in church, and we feel a sense of reverential awe. Um, but I have to be honest with you and say I'd sort of forgotten about how important it was to do obeisance before the Lord, uh, to kneel before the Lord. But uh, I did a little more research with this, and I saw that over and over in the New Testament, when it says worship, that's what it's talking about. And also, there are very many references in worship to the Old Testament are talking about the same thing. So I want to suggest that you do something. I want to suggest that you find ways in your worship to just kneel before the Lord. Um, and I want to tell you a couple of ways that you might be able to do that. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. Uh, but a couple of ways that you could do that uh, would be before worship starts on Sunday morning, if you just came and knelt at the altar and prayed for a moment or for a few minutes, that would be a really cool thing. Um, I know when you come in here, and I like it this way, when you come in here, there's a lot of greeting and a lot of hugging, and we want it that way. But it would be okay if you wanted to just come kneel at the altar and pray for a moment or a couple of minutes before going and finding your seat. That would be a way that we could worship God by physically kneeling before him. Um, I'm really glad that when it's not summertime, when we have communion, we kneel for communion. I think that's really important, and I know you do too because you've told me. The other thing I just want to uh, sort of share with you in closing is when you're praying at home, I have to say that when I became a teenager, I learned something called conversational prayer, and that was where um, you talk to the Lord Jesus like he's your friend, and you just carry on a conversation with Jesus, your friend, and Jesus is our friend. And I love praying that way, but I tell you, uh, when I was a boy, uh, I was taught to get on my knees and say my prayers at night before getting into bed. You know what I'm talking about, right? You get on your knees before, you know, at the bed, and you pray, and then you get in bed. You know, I, I, I kind of got out of that habit. I know my mother never got out of that habit, because once in a while, I'd, I'd come into her room uh, to say something, and I'd catch her on her knees uh, praying. Uh, I hope sometimes somebody catches you on your knees praying. So I just want to suggest to you that when you're having your prayer time during the week, it might be a cool thing if you haven't done it lately, if you get on your knees uh, to pray some, or if you do complete obeisance. Uh, this is totally scriptural. Just lay out flat on the floor before the Lord and pray. Um, it's a really cool thing to do. I hope this has been a little enriching for you as you think about different worship practices in your heart, in your mind, and, and with your body. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> Closing hymn, God be with you till we meet again. Oh, and I should say, the altar is open if you want to come and kneel and pray.
Receive this benediction. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy. Unto the only wise God be honor, glory, dominion, and power. And may the love of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.